follow John chapter 14. It's a little warm in here today. Some of you might have noticed that there's a sign on the door that the air conditioner in this particular room is out of commission at the moment. It needs a part, and the earliest we'll be able to get the part is tomorrow. So you can pray that God would speed that up, because we have vacation Bible school this week, and we use this room, and it's going to be hot. So we're leaving the doors open so we can try to get some of the cool air from the other rooms, but uh, we'll just try to get through it, okay? I'm probably as hot-blooded as anybody in the room, so if you're warm, I'm probably warmer. But we can get through it, right? That's why God made sweat glands. We don't like to show them off, but God made them nonetheless. All right, John chapter 14, um, we've been looking at the red letters. Red letters indicate anytime Jesus is speaking. And so we've been working our way through John, seeing what Jesus has to say. And this morning we're John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. And would you please stand while I read these verses? This is Jesus speaking, and he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the, to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. All right, you may be seated. Uh, this is a great scriptural passage of hope and encouragement. Um, I've used it frequently at uh, funerals just because it's such an encouraging word. Um, but we just happen to be here today. And I see three thoughts here that will offer us all hope today. And so this is a three-point sermon, even though we're doing red letters. And here's the first point. Peace is promised. Jesus promises peace. In verse 1, he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. He promises peace. Now, we've all experienced sorrow, fear, doubt, discouragement. Am I right? Have you experienced any of those things? Okay. Those things are common. We all go through things like that. There, there are seasons in life, there are circumstances in life that lead us to a point of being discouraged or uh, in, in grief and those sort of things. It's all common. And sometimes we wonder why God would leave us all alone. Have you ever been there when you're in that downtime where you're discouraged or, or in, in a moment of sorrow or something like that and you kind of wonder where did God go? Have you ever been there? I, I think we all do that from time to time. We wonder where God is. It's common. King David wrote this in Psalm 22. You recognize the words, I think. He wrote these words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from the words of my groaning. He says, my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. <laughs> that was King David. He's a man after God's own heart. And yet, he knew what it was like to feel like God was nowhere near. God, I'm praying, I'm calling out, but you're not answering me. Where are you? And I think we all experience that from time to time. And it's common to humanity. In fact, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ quoted those words as he hung on the cross. If Jesus could experience that kind of feeling... So can we, wondering, where is God? What is going on? You know, that feeling of abandonment, the questions, all of that, it's, it's common. And there's no sin in just the feelings you have. It's not sinful to feel that way. And yet here Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. He promises peace to those who will trust in him. How many want peace in their life? Yeah, I think we all want peace. We don't want all the trouble. We want peace. Or if we have trouble, we want to be at peace while we go through the trouble. You know, we want that kind of experience. And uh, Duke University did a study on peace of mind. And they, they give some tips here on 
uh, things that contribute to uh, emotional and mental stability from their study. Number one, the absence of suspicion and resentment. Nursing a grudge was a major factor in unhappiness. So if you want to be unhappy, just keep on nursing that grudge. Okay? Number two, not living in the past. An unwholesome preoccupation with old mistakes and failures will lead to depression. Number three, not wasting time and energy fighting conditions that you cannot change. There are some things that you have zero control over. And they're saying you should just cooperate with life instead of trying to run away from it, trying to fight it. Number four, force yourself to stay involved with the living world and resist the temptation to withdraw during periods of emotional stress. That's good advice. Number five, refuse to indulge in self-pity when life hands you a raw deal. Accept the fact that nobody gets through life without some sorrow and misfortune. Life happens. Okay? Number six, cultivate old-fashioned virtues. Love, humor, compassion, and loyalty. Number seven, do not expect too much of yourself. When there is too wide of a gap between self-expectation and your ability to meet the goals that you have set, feelings of inadequacy are inevitable. So set goals, but don't set them so far out there that there's no way you'll ever get them. Number eight, find something bigger than yourself to believe in. Self-centered, egotistical people score the lowest in any test for measuring happiness. Isn't that good? That was a Duke University study, and I think number eight is their most important point because it lines up with Scripture. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. And then he follows it right up with, trust in God. Believe in something bigger than yourself. Psalm 125, verse 1 says, Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. When you trust in the Lord, He gets you through, and you don't have to be shaken by the circumstances of life. 1 Peter 5, 7, Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. Just hand it over to God. And we've talked a lot the last few weeks about God's words in Isaiah 55, verse 9, where he says, My ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God knows way more than we know. He does. His understanding is beyond ours. And so we need to trust Him. And And we actually said these words this morning because God is worthy of our trust because God is good and all the time so we can trust Him. Trust Him. It really is an issue of trust. Even in the midst of trouble and in discouragement, God is still worthy of our trust. And when we put our trust in Him, He provides peace. We want that peace, don't we? You betcha comes from trusting the Lord. Then the second thought this morning that Jesus conveys is that a place is prepared. In verse 2, he says, In my Father's house are many rooms. The King James Version says many mansions. He says, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. A place is prepared for us. That's the great hope of all believers. This life is not all that there is. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. There is so much more beyond this earth and the timeline that we each have on it. There is so much beyond that. There is a place that is more real and more powerful than anything you have ever experienced in this lifetime. And when Jesus left his disciples, he ascended into heaven, he said that he was going to prepare a place. Now think about the place that he must be preparing. Because, you know, I've, I've traveled a little bit, particularly around the United States. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 that God created this whole world in six days. 
And I appreciate the creation that God has done. You know, I've been out in Colorado and, and out to the West Coast and the, the mountains. Wow. You know, pretty spectacular. I've been to the oceans. And, you know, you can't ever see the end of it. And then even around here, I, I just enjoy the woods and and uh, rivers and, and lakes and that sort of thing. We see what God has done. He did all of that in six days. Okay? How long ago did Jesus ascend into heaven? About almost 2,000 years now. And he was going to go and prepare a place. Can you imagine? I can't, really. But can you get an idea of how fantastic the place must be? Six days versus a couple thousand years of preparation. Wow. Revelation 21 just gives us a little glimpse of it. Just a glimpse. And it speaks of the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And it shines with the glory of God. And its brilliance is like a very precious jewel, clear as crystal. And it has gates that each gate is a giant single pearl. And it has a, a, a main street through the city that's made of gold, as pure as transparent glass. And the Lord and the Lamb are the temple of the city. And the city doesn't need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. And the Lamb is its lamp. Wow. Now, that's just a glimpse of the new Jerusalem, and that doesn't even include all of the rest of the, what he has been preparing for us. That's just the holy city. You understand, we only get a glimpse of what he has in mind for us. And that's not all. Revelation 21, verse 4 tells us that he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Doesn't that sound good? We get to go to a place where there's no more pain? Hallelujah. Now I'm to an age now that I do a little bit of yard work and I feel it for the rest of the week. Some of you younger people, you, you know, you feel it for a few minutes and then it's over. But when you're, you know, in this season of life, you feel it a little longer. <laughs> But we get to go to a place where there's no more pain and no more sorrow. That's what he has in store for us. Somebody said the gains of heaven will more than compensate for the losses of earth. That's the place he has prepared for us. There's a story also about a little girl that was walking with her daddy out at night. One night, she's looking up at the stars, admiring the, the sky. She says, Daddy, if the wrong side of heaven is so beautiful, what must the right side be? Yeah. Little kid's imagination. It's a great place that he's prepared for us. It's not only a place of beauty and of plenty, but it's a place of peace and power without pain. And beyond all of those benefits and those natural things that we think of, it's a place where Jesus is. And we get to see Jesus face to face. We get to see the glory of God. You know, I, I mentioned the glory of God earlier as we were kind of wrapping up the, the music set. And we need the presence of God. And we need to experience the glory of God. But I tell you what, on this side of heaven, we only get little, little drops now and then. And we think how wonderful that is when the Spirit of God moves in the house. Let me tell you, that is just a drop compared to the ocean of the glory we will experience in heaven. It's going to be phenomenal. The truth is, the Scripture only gives us little samples of what heaven is going to be like, of what that prepared place is going to be like. But we know that Jesus is there. One theologian described it this way. Heaven is an unknown region with a well-known inhabitant. I like it. Where Jesus is. How many of you have a dog, pet dog? You ever been on the other side of a door from your pet dog? The 
dog wants in, right? Does it matter to the dog what you might be on the other side of that door? Except you're there. He knows you're there. He wants to get where you are. So, guess we're the dogs. Jesus is the master. He's on the other side of the door. We just want to get where he is. He is there in that prepared place. And then, finally, the third thought this morning, a pathway is provided. Jesus says in verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, here he promises peace. And that's a great comfort because we all need peace and we go through troubles and we want the peace of God in our life. So we grasp onto that. He also promises a place that's going to be prepared. And that's a great hope. It's something to look forward to, something that kind of gets us through the troubles of this life. But the question is, how can we be sure that we get in on the deal? There's a place, but how, how am I going to get there? Well, Jesus said that he is the way. He's the way to the Father. You can't get to that place any other way. Now, it's a popular notion to think that if you're just a good person, you'll get there. But let me tell you this. You cannot be good enough. Do you know what the standard of heaven is? Absolute perfection. Only perfect people get to go to heaven. So, in your own ability, how many of you are going to heaven? <laughs> nope. I am not perfect. I, I know that comes as a shock to some of you. I am not perfect. Well, let me tell you, neither are you. Okay? We all need a Savior. We need somebody to get us a ticket because we can't buy the ticket on our own. Okay? And we most, mostly, most people understand by practical experience that you can't be good enough. How many of you set out, decided, I am never doing that, whatever, again, fill in the blank. How long does that last? Or, I am for sure doing this every single day for the rest of my life. How long does that last? Y you see, we can't quite pull it off. We all make attempts at being good people, but we fail over and over and over again. That's really what the picture, if, you, if I could just give you a, a, a lesson in theology real briefly, that's the story of the Old Testament. It shows how you cannot be good enough. That's the Old Testament. All the laws, nobody can actually keep them. It's impossible. So we need something else. You can't be good enough. But guess what? Jesus is. Jesus lived a perfect life. He was perfect in every way. And he has volunteered to be our substitute. Because only perfect people get to go to heaven. And so Jesus is willing to stamp himself on us. So that when God looks, he only sees Jesus. He doesn't see Phil, who is not perfect. He sees Jesus. Jesus has access to heaven. Jesus is the way. So our only hope of salvation, our only hope of landing in that prepared place that we all love to think about and hope for is through Jesus Christ. It's the only way. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Only Jesus. 1 Peter 3.18 Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. That's why He died on the cross. Because we are all unrighteous. We don't deserve any of the good things that God offers. And God saw that, and He sent Jesus to be the perfect one, to make a way for us. He wants to open the door. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, There is one God, 
and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men. It's a very popular notion today to say that all roads lead to heaven, or there are many ways to heaven. But the Bible says that is absolutely not true. The Bible says there is one way. That's what the Bible says, one way. And Jesus is that way. It's not open Bible church. Don't misconstrue my words. It's not open Bible church. It's Jesus. Jesus is the way. He is the only way to heaven, and all other paths are actually detours to doom and destruction. Billy Graham. Most everybody's heard of Billy Graham. He says, I'm not going to heaven because I preach to great crowds of people. I'm going to heaven because Christ died on that cross. None of us are going to heaven because we're good, and we're not going to heaven because we have worked. We're not going to heaven even because we pray. We're going to heaven because of what he did on the cross. And all I have to do is receive him. And it's so easy to receive Christ that millions stumble over its sheer simplicity. He did all the work. He did it all. He is the way. We just need to follow him. So here we have Jesus promised us peace. And let me tell you this, that Jesus himself fulfills that promise because Jesus is our peace. Jesus promised a place that he has been preparing. And let me tell you again, Jesus is the place. He's the main attraction of the place. And then a pathway has been provided. And guess what? Again, the answer is Jesus. Jesus is the pathway. It's all in Jesus. We all want peace. As we go through troubles of life and we want peace. And most everybody's interested in eternity in heaven. Yeah, I don't want to go to the other option. You know? Those things all come through Jesus Christ. Because He is the way. In fact, He is the only way. And so I say, follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. He's the way. He's all of it. Follow Jesus. Have I said it too many times yet? Nope. Follow Jesus. I think I need to say it again. Follow Jesus. <laughs> That's where it's all at, folks. Follow Jesus. Would you please bow your heads for a moment? I wonder if there's anybody here today that has yet to make that decision to follow Jesus. Because I want to pray for you. Maybe you've tried to be a good person or you've, you, you know, you've tried different things. And you realize, yeah, this is right. There, none of those really work. Today, would you decide... I'm, I'm going to follow Jesus then. Let, let me follow Jesus. If that's you, the, today would be the first time you really you decide, I'm going to follow Jesus now. Would you raise your hand because I want to pray for you. Yep, there's one right there. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, that's two. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. And now perhaps there's others in the room that you, you've been around a while. You know what I'm talking about. But maybe you could admit today I haven't really been following Jesus very well lately. And I need God's grace to help me really, sincerely follow Jesus. Now if that's you, would you raise your hand? Okay. Now there's a bunch of people. God, we need your grace. 
so often we try on our own, and we can't do it. And you're, the Bible, the Word, verifies that. We cannot do it. So we need your grace. Lord, for those two that raised their hand that said, today, I'm deciding to follow Jesus. God, I pray that they would actually follow you and that you would give them grace, Lord God, and save them in the name of Jesus. Forgive them of their sins and help them start a new life today of following you. Lord, for others, many who raise their hands saying, yeah, I haven't been following as closely as I should. Lord, I pray that you would help us to stay right in line behind Jesus, not trying to make our own way, not being distracted and veering off on other paths, but following you wholeheartedly. No one else but you. Help us, God. It's so easy for us as human beings to try to make our own way. And yet, it really goes nowhere. Help us, God, to every day get up first thing in the morning and say, Today I'm following Jesus. And then perhaps an hour later, say, This hour I'm following Jesus. And then maybe every five minutes, this next five minutes, I'm following Jesus. <laughs> Whatever it takes, Lord, help us. Give us grace, Lord to follow you. We know that you are the answer. We know that you are the way, and yet sometimes we struggle to really follow you. Lord, help us. And go with us, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. God's blessings on you. Have a great week. We'll see you next time, all right?